Good afternoon, everyone. It's my heartly pleasure to in introduce Abod Aras, who is the Vice Chair Chairperson of Yapo and Chief Executive Officer of Welfare of Stray Dogs (WSD). He is is an MBA in marketing and graduate in hotel management. Abod has worked in corporate sector with companies like DHL Worldwide Express, managing customer services and sales. His passion for animals led him to quit his job and uh, and he joined uh, WSD in 2000, where he volunteered since 1995. WSD pioneered the on-site first aid program in India in year 1996. Today. A board will shed light on key points to be considered for the administration of first aid for animals um, based on his own experiences. So meanwhile, if any one of the attendees is having any questions, kindly feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and all your queries will be answered after the presentation. Thank you. Over to you. In, um, you know, I must, uh, uh, I mean, in the sense that just for before the presentation, like to uh, let you know that, um, you know, some of the, the objectives of this presentation, of course, are, you know, information on basic first aid and uh, or how on site first aid is, is advantageous in some cases, remember, not all cases. But if you're thinking that, you know, after this presentation, you can head out and start, you know, treating uh, animals or um, immediately, or, uh, you know, you're uh, uh, suddenly become a veterinarian, you know, that is not true. Um, uh, all this requires, you know, this is theoretical knowledge that, that is there, but some practical experience needs to be, you know, gathered before you start. Uh, let me just quickly tell you that, you know, why I started this uh, way back in 1996. Um, I remember I, I saw a puppy which had a little wound and the only thing I could do is that take it to a hospital. So I admitted it to a hospital and forgot it, forgot all about it. And about 15 days later, uh, you know, I got a call from my mother that the animal hospital has uh, sent a puppy home. And I went home and I was shocked to see the puppy. It was, you know thin and pot bellied and almost dying. And, um, and I, uh, I didn't know anything about uh, first aid. I kept calling the vet crying throughout the night and the puppy didn't make it. And you couldn't blame the hospital because remember that, uh, you know, it has a little wound and it could have been treated on the street itself. At the hospital, there are all kinds of dogs, the puppy's immunity levels are low. It would have caught some infection from another dog. And, and this is what it ended up with. And that's when I thought that, you know, one should um, start treating animals that can be treated on the street itself. Um, so um, uh, next slide, please. So naturally, if you have to administer first aid, you know, to an animal, um, first thing is that you need to know how to approach it, you know, and um, uh, that is why, uh, Next slide, please. Yeah. And that's why it's important to understand the body language of an animal. Um, uh, you must also be able to, you know, uh, understand that, you know, behaviorists will tell you that there are different uh, behavior traits in, in dogs. And I've just divided them into four traits. There are many more and we, I'm not a behaviorist, but just with the experience of uh, so many years of uh, treating animals on the street. And uh, this is mainly dogs. Yeah, next slide, please. So the first is, you know, a dog that is uh, uh, playful and happy. So this dog, of course, is easier to treat. And, um, you know, um, uh, such a dog, these are the, some of the uh, qualities that it will uh, display. I think there's a lag in the slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think one, of course, thing also you must realize is how to approach a dog that is in distress. So uh, behaviorists will tell you that, you know, you need to 
uh, show submissive and non-threatening body language and um, you know uh, avoid eye contact because it can be threatening uh, uh, dropping your shoulders down uh, approach from the side never from the front you know uh, bending down to the level of the dog is not a good idea because um, uh, I mean uh, trying to touch them standing upright you know acts as a threat so let them of course smell you please remember that this dog is hurt anyway and he's in pain and he could uh, she could bite uh, when in when in pain next slide please <clears throat> So as I was telling you, um, uh, uh, this is you can clearly make out from the happiness of the face of this dog that it's a playful and happy dog. Uh, so these are some of the signs to look out for that the ears ears are perked up. You know, there's a twinkle in the eyes. Uh, uh, it's a relaxed mouth. The body is relaxed. Yeah, the dog might be jumping, bounding. You know, wagging its tail, circling you. You know. Um, uh, this again, I'm talking about, uh, you know, dogs that naturally are not uh, comatose. And um, these are dogs maybe with wounds and eye infections and so on. Yeah. So um, uh, this dog is, of course, this kind of a dog is easy to treat. Next slide, please. So th this dog is a little difficult to treat. Remember that uh, he's scared of people. And um, um, so there's fear. Um, uh, remember one thing that, uh, you know, uh, dogs do not want to um, naturally bite in the, I mean, there's a behavioral trait that uh, they say that, you know, dogs rather uh, flight instead of flight, fight. So um, this kind of a dog, of course, um, the ears are laid back, uh, you know, the pupils are dilated, um, you can see the body is tense, you know, sometimes it's shivering, um, the tail is between the, um, uh, you know, legs. Also, if you've ever noticed that if a dog is scared or fearful, you know, he will, if you call out to that dog, he'll bring his tongue out and, you know, put it around the um, uh, uh, mouth. So um, uh, that, that clearly tells you that, you know, it's telling you stay away, I'm scared of you. And of course, sometimes a dog might uh, urinate in, involuntarily. Next slide, please. So um, uh, some dogs, of course, uh, can display aggressive behavior. So when you close close to them, they'll clearly tell you that uh, you know, please stay away. They might growl. You know, uh, again, they have a tense body. Uh, the lips might be open. You know, they might bare their teeth. Um, uh, they might be snarling, growling, barking loudly. So this kind of dog again is uh, difficult to treat. And the next slide is of a dog that is submissive. You know, uh, can you imagine this photograph was taken uh, at Churchgate Station? You know, this dog, whenever she used to see me, Rani, her name was, she used to just turn around. And there are millions of people going, you know, up and down to catch uh, the Bombay locals' lifeline of Bombay. And uh, she used to do that in the middle of uh, so many people. But so this is an easy uh, dog to uh, treat. She trusts you blindly, you know. And um, so, of course, it's rolling on its back, exposing its uh, abdomen. Um, you know, the tail is uh, held low, you know. So this dog, of course, it's easier to treat. Next slide, please. So now, of course, you understood um, how to... Uh, you know, distinguish between different behavior traits. Of course, please remember that it's not as simple. Years and years of, uh, you know, um, understanding dog behavior, you know, helps you with this. Uh, but how do you restrain an injured dog? You know, so, uh, I mean, to be able to administer first aid, you need to restrain the dog, tie the mouth. Yeah. So one of the easiest method is muzzling a dog. And remember, the pet muzzles really don't work on, on street dogs. So, um, you know, what can work is that uh, you can take a, a gauze bandage, you know, and cut it according to so a long strip of gauze bandage, you can take it. And so, so if you see the photo photograph for the illustration, yeah, that's how you muzzle the dog. Uh, not so simple when a dog is the fearful or aggressive, but um, uh, what you'll need to do is that make a loop, you know, and uh, you'll have to 
make a loop which is a little large and then try and uh, uh, put it around the dog's mouth, you know, approach it from the back or the side and, um, you know, tighten it and then uh, take it around the ears and again, tighten it and, um, you know, tie a, a shoelace knot. Because sometimes what happens is that if the dog is uh, runs away with it, you know, with it being on, at least it can, it can be removed by him very easily. Um, also, you must, uh, um, some of the other methods are, of course, that um, uh, you can you hold the scruff of the dog very tightly so that it can't bite you and then, then tie the, the muzzle. Um, some other methods that are approved, of course, by the Animal Welfare Board of India are, uh, you know, nets, uh, butterfly nets. But remember that you need, I mean, it's a huge uh, uh, kind of equipment to carry it around. Um, soft loops also are useful, but you need to be very careful that they can't, they don't choke the dog. And um, also Balinese pole nets, uh, if you're trained to use, uh, can be used. Um, next. So I don't know how many of you have been bitten by a dog, but I've at least been bitten many times. Of course, uh, always my fault uh, while treating a dog. Once, of course, when we were vaccinating dogs, uh, the dog from behind came and bit me, saying he must have said, why are you uh, poking my friend? But um, uh, we must learn why dogs bite. Uh, remember that dogs don't bite unless provoked, but what are the provocations? And it's very important that we know, and we also spread this, you know, to uh, children and so on, you know, of why dogs can bite. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the reasons why dogs can bite. And if you see, the third reason is if he's ill or he's in pain, you know. So, um, or I mean, you know, as animal people, we want to go and touch every uh, street animal we see, but uh, maybe the dog doesn't want to be touched or the cat doesn't want to be touched. Uh, and also in terms of uh, a female, you know, which has just given puppies, you know, um, might bite if you say, oh, so sweet, let me go and pick up this puppy. And uh, the mother doesn't think that it's sweet at all. Uh, she might feel threatened and, and bite. Um, uh, one thing you must realize, next slide, please. One thing you must realize is that if you're bitten or licked, you know, on a wound, then uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, Post-bite care is very important. Uh, you need to wash the wound with soap and water for 15 minutes. Uh, the World Health Organization says that 94.4% of the viral particles are washed away. Then you can disinfect with uh, an antiseptic, iodine, uh, povidine uh, is, is better. And of course, go to uh, the doctor for um, post-bite injections. And also, uh, they will tell you to take a tetanus shot. This is very, very important because uh, though I'm not going into rabies, um, uh, but uh, uh, rabies is pre prevalent in the world and uh, India is endemic. And um, you must uh, be careful in terms of uh, as people who are say feeding animals or treating animals and so on. Yeah, you anyway should take uh, pre-exposure shots. All of us do that. Uh, but if you're bitten, you need to um, uh, do this. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, babies is um, prevent, highly preventable, but not curable. So naturally, if you do this, yeah, you will be able to prevent um, uh, the disease. Uh, sometimes it's, if it's a very bad bite, uh, the doctor or the hospital might tell you to take uh, immunoglobulin in the wound. Um, uh, uh, remember that uh, rabies injections are available free at, at municipal hospitals also. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to understand uh, a dog, uh, you know, uh, next please, to understand, you know, the treatment of a dog, how can you do that? I mean, you just need to be uh, observing an animal, you know, because how do you know that it requires treatment? Yeah. So first, of course, you can observe at a distance and look if there are any signs of pain. Uh, how is it gaits and gait and posture? Uh, how is the body condition of the animal? Um, is there any signs of aggression because of the pain? Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, uh, also, you need to watch its daily activities. So 
um, uh, is, is it eating properly? You know, is the water intake okay? Is it too much? Is it too little? Um, uh, again, going into some gory details like, uh, you know, uh, the stools and urine. So uh, what are the consistency of the stools? Uh, sometimes you might see something red in the stools. So this is, this is how you know that there's something wrong. Um, uh, what about its mental condition in terms of, uh, you know, is it uh, alert? Is it lethargic? You know, you've seen a dog who's always playful, but one day you'll see it just uh, lying down, not getting up, very lethargic. Then you know there's, there's a cue that there's something wrong. Of course, many of these things, you may not be able to do something yourself. You might have to take the dog to a vet, but this is a cue for you to understand that there is there's something wrong. And next is also, next slide please, um, next is physical examination, which means right from observing the dog visually from the head to tail and seeing, you know, are there any injuries on the dog or uh, is the skin condition okay? Um, uh, what about uh, eyes or ears? Is it free from discharge or, from the, or mouth also? Then uh, the, the color of the gums, you know, it needs to be pink. Um, uh, in term, also dehydration. So how do you know that? Because if you pick up the um, uh, skin wherever it's loose and leave it, it needs to go back uh, fast. If it's or if it just stays there, that means the dog is dehydrated. So these are all cues for you to um, uh, think that oh, this dog uh, uh, might require or should would require a, a veterinarian to uh, check it. So you might be able to. Take, take the dog to the to the vet. Also looking at the rectal area, you know, of the dog, whether um, uh, there's any protrusion or there's, uh, there's diarrhea, you know, or the dog sometimes if it's constipated, it tries hard to, you know, pass tools but can't, you know. So, so these are some of the things that you should um, look out for. Next slide, please. Now, um, you know, we started the on-site first aid program, like I said, in 96, I trained under a veterinarian. And again, I'm not a vet, basic first aid. Um, so um, uh, these are the different reasons why it's advantageous. One, it's suitable for dis different levels of infrastructure in that city. You know, we started something, FIAPO started something in an on-site first aid in Varanasi, and there was no hospital, no shelter. And, um, you know, uh, it really, um, uh, we found out that actually there were so many people on the ghats, shop, shopkeepers, etc., treating animals, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, feeding animals, you know, so, but they didn't know what to do when, when the animal was hurt, yeah, so um, it, it works with different levels, like see, Bombay might have a hospital, or your city might have a hospital, but the second reason is that it frees cases that should be shouldn't be admitted to a hospital. So at least emergency cases can be admitted there. So a dog like a puppy with a wound, I could have treated on the street and uh, cured it. And that kennel could have been used for, for somebody that really required, uh, you know, that admission. Um, it also has reduced trauma because the dog is in, in its own environment or the cat is, is in its own environment. Um, it also is a community-based program. People see you coming, treating the animal there. So it really helps, you know, people, you know, actually the, the status of the street animal actually goes up because they say that, oh, they, these people are coming and it, it's not, you know, harming anybody. So, so uh, it's not going to harm us too. Um, it also helps, uh, you know, catch the dog next time or when it's healthy for sterilization or, or revaccination. Um, it also increases awareness, like I said before, but also reduces cruelty. I remember a volunteer used to go to a slum and a dogs with maggot wounds used to be beaten or, uh, you know, shooed away. And the same people, when he saw the volunteer coming and treating this maggot wound, actually started calling and helping, you know. So it made a huge change of the perception of how people looked at street animals. And also it's proactive you know, a lot of times we, to, I, we still get calls and say there's a dog in so-and-so area and we say, oh, are you talking about this dog? We're already treating it, you know? Yeah, so these are the various advantages. Next slide, please. 
it also has helped us um, you know uh, uh, know the names of the dogs i'm sure you would also know names of the dogs of the rajus tomu tommy's kali sharuks um, salmans and aishwaryas in your city and um, it also has uh, there every dog has a story just like us every street animal a street dog a street cat has a story and you also then can track its sterilization and vaccination status and the health status next slide please uh, this actually led me to write a little book on for children called my city my dogs on uh, real stories of street dogs in in mumbai next slide please um and there are two of such dogs i would like to mention one is bush and he was a dog that used to live outside an american consulate the old american consulate in mumbai and um, he was named book bush because of an interesting story that um that time george bush junior bush of course passed away some many years ago but uh, i'm talking about the dog and um, um uh, george bush junior uh, you know was the president that time when this puppy came to the american consulate and he had a cat called india so um, so the guards and the security guards used to look after them uh, him said that you know if they can name uh, their cat india we are going to call him bush and bush was loved by everybody in that neighborhood and when actually i became famous because of bush because when bush passed on um, we had a little uh, memorial on facebook and the times of india put picked it up and put it on the front page and that's when i came to know the amount of people that knew bush and also um, there used to be a guy who said that i will you know i um, uh, i used to give my dabba when i used to go to school to bush because my mother used to be happy thinking i ate the dabba bush used to be happy to eat the food and i used to be happy that i didn't have to eat maybe some sabji that uh, karela or something i don't know it bush ate karela but whatever sabji then like dudhi that um, she had given him uh next slide please and the second dog i'd like to mention is traffic who is to be looked after by these traffic policemen and he um these are of course dogs that we have treated a lot on site and uh, that's why we know them and um, uh, the traffic policemen used to look after them feed them and whenever they used to pull up anybody for a traffic or offense traffic used to go and stand next to the um uh, car uh, as if he's on guard and they say a large janam mein he must have been a traffic policeman so uh, i'm sure you have many many such stories next and this is all thanks to the on site first day now what are the kind of dogs that you will encounter if i may use the word um on the street for treatment uh, one are easily catchable so the muzzle that you can use again the behavioral traits may be friendly or uh, playful or submissive second are difficult to catch of course please remember that for um, all this to work the, da- the dog needs to be near you if the dog is running far away you are not going to be able to treat it so uh, the difficult to uh, catch dogs um you might require two people so uh, and and of course the muzzle um or there could be a dog that can be caught by a caretaker or a feeder over time you'll know that today also there's so many people who feed animals and bless them because uh, they are, they do amazing service not only to the animal but also when the animal is in uh, is uh, in distress or needs treatment uh, an ngo or uh, people who uh, administer first aid or veterinarians can can actually these guys can hold or catch the the animal and uh, can be treated or taken away for treatment um uh, sometimes a uh, dogs can't be caught even by the caretakers but it's something not very severe and after consultation with a veterinarian uh, medicine can be put in the food and given and some dogs of course can't be cat- caught at all so you, you might have to have um, professional catchers going and catching them and of course these dogs then cannot be treated on the street or cats for that matter next so what are the types of cases that can be treated uh, on site um over the years we have uh, successfully treated cases like skin disease uh, wounds uh, maggot infested wounds ear and eye infections and tick and flea infestations um next slide please um this is a list of basic first aid that you can have in your kit um uh, uh, i mean generally we do this um, offline and of course 
um, you know, uh, the medicines are shown. We also have sometimes a de demo dog, which of course wouldn't be a dog that you would find on the street, but for whatever it is, uh, you know, a dog maybe with a wound. But um, uh, the first aid kit consists of, uh, uh, you know, a basic things like uh, vocadine or betadine, which is an iodine, you know, various brands. Um, you can also have hydrogen peroxide. Um, Hymax is very important. Uh, it's a ointment, um, rather smelly ointment that actually keeps away the flies. Um, acrylin is a yellow ointment and I'll come to, of course, what all these will be used for. Um, this is a sulfide powder, which is easily available at any chemist, which is a nebesal for neosporin. Um, we also use something called a yellow ointment. I'll come to this later. But this is something that we make at the center, which has sulfur base, but uh, for skin problems. But uh, there are various, uh, you know, I'm sure if I ask you, you'll have some other, you know, um, uh, concoction that, that can be used, which of course needs to be safe uh, to put to, uh, topically on, on a uh, dog. Uh, please remember that a lot of things can't be used on cats, so you need to be careful. Um, Kailaj Jivan is available. It's an Ayurvedic um, ointment, which is available everywhere. Uh, Pendistrin also um, and Neosporin ophthalmic can be a part of your uh, kit. Um, uh, neem oil, um, oral ivermectin. I'm sure all of you have would always already treat animals or know about maggot wounds. Um, use this, but you need to be very, very careful about uh, ivermectin. I would use it only if required. And, um, you know, um, uh, and topic cure is a eucalyptus ba base spray, which is, um, uh, which is good, only it makes a hissing noise. So sometimes the animal gets scared and wants to run. Of course, you need to have cotton and gauze bandage in your kit. Um, there are various um, safer options for uh, using for maggot wounds, which are things like uh, DMAG spray or scavon, you know, scavon uh, cream or fungo, you know. So these are the ones that can be used. Uh, eucalyptus oil is good also to have in the kit and uh, syringes, you know, to flush, not to give injections, of course, but to flush the wound if, if required. And forceps uh, uh, that you need to, of course, sanitize for removing maggots. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, we also used homeopathy in um, in uh, animal treatment. Um, uh, remember, homeopathy works very differently; that it treats uh, the symptom, not the disease. So you can't have a common remedy for. I'm just saying, giving an example for a dog with a kidney problem, so, which means that these are some of the. Um, uh, remedies that can be used in a generic fashion. So Arnica is good for using um, all kinds of injuries that are not wounds, so limbs, etc. And also for your, your hematomas. Um, uh, your hematomas are, you know, I don't know if you've seen that the ear flops up like a balloon sometimes uh, in a dog. And um, traditionally, one needs to take the dog to a hospital facility and remove the um, uh, liquid and, and uh, 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 then, uh, you know, it is stitched up, it looks like a web. And sometimes a lot of times it also recurs. So we've seen uh, Arnica working well on this. Uh, symptom, symphytums are good for fracture, which does not mean that you just give the homeopathy medicine and if it's a break, you just don't do anything about it. You'll have to uh, get an X-ray done and, and so on, and uh, if the plaster is required or sometimes pinning is required, that, that will have to be done. But it just heals um, the bone faster. Uh, cantharis is amazing for burn injuries. Uh, cantharis Q is a mother tincture. Uh, calendula Q is very good for topical uh, 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 um, uh, treatment on for wounds. Um, Passiflora is good for calming dogs and dress, Drosera is good for a kennel cough or a hacking cough. You know, sometimes you'll see a dog coughing and you think nothing is coming out, but it's coughing in a very hacking uh, kind of manner. 
uh, remember homeopathy works uh, in the sense that you can either give it in a liquid form or pills but liquid is better and it can't be put in anything else other than water or or milk so one dose about three four drops of of the of the liquid uh, next um, slide please now coming to basic treatment of uh, wounds now just like if you have a wound and uh, you of course may not get admitted to a hospital for a small wound uh, you will go to the doctor or even a nurse and uh, she will put something topical so similarly these are wounds which are not um, maggoted yeah next slide so what do you do um, the first thing to do is clean the wound if it's very dirty you can use uh, hydrogen peroxide um, remember that dogs on the streets uh, you know they will accumulate dirt etc uh, uh so you need to clean the wound thoroughly, thoroughly with a cotton remove the pus and um, uh, you can then flush the wound with uh, iodine if it's a deep wound you can uh, like i mentioned earlier take a syringe and and flush it and uh, then sprinkle you know any sulfite powder on it and uh, then apply uh, high max and this is very important because please remember that a uh, street animal one you can't bandage uh, animals on the street you know it will become dirty and worse and two is that street animals are very prone to um, maggot wounds and especially where they can't lick so generally on the head or the back or the tail you know so um, in fact a lot of times uh, if where they can lick a wound you know if you don't even treat it it will uh, you know the saliva acts as a antiseptic and it will heal of course you you need to keep watching uh, the dog so instead you might as well treat it but um, hymax becomes very important for treatment as the last um, you know uh, what you put because it keeps away the flies yeah so um, this is how you can go about treating a, a simple wound remember one thing that all this is applicable if the dog is healthy which means that you know you can't keep doing this if the dog is dehydrated it might require uh, saline or it might be require uh, you know nutritional support then you need to have a vet you know come in and and give uh, the appropriate treatment next so maggot wounds i don't know how many of you have seen uh, maggots but there are these terrible creatures you can see that um uh, slide on top uh, you know these are um, the larva of the fly that uh, lay uh, so the flies lay eggs on on a open wound and generally like i said where a dog can't lick so common maggot wound areas would be the head face you know neck um the back you know the anus near the tail so um and uh, the, the they complete the life cycle so the larva which is the which are maggots complete the life cycle on the uh, dog eating eating almost eating the dog i mean alive so these are terrible and um, uh, how can you treat maggot wounds uh, again um, the disclaimer is that a dog needs to be um, you know more or less healthy so uh, which means it doesn't require fluid therapy and, and so on uh, next slide please so the first thing to do is of course you need to kill the maggots i'm sorry that that is one thing that i do um, you know uh, kill away because it's really horrible for the animal um, so uh, you can use the different things like uh, eucalyptus oil also brings the maggots out it doesn't kill them but other things like scavon or uh, you know oral ivermectin can be put on the wound or uh, uh, dmag or fungo or high tech these are different um i think in olden days i'm saying 20 years ago we used to uh, use chloroform which which is to burn and of course chloroform is not available uh, uh, easily for obvious reasons but um, uh, so we had to put a local anesthetic before and then put chloroform but now there are so many other um, you know uh, applications that can be put then um, if you, if it's a deep seated uh, maggot wound you need to use a syringe so that the, whatever you're putting reaches you know to that pockets uh, that have been eaten up and you can plug that wound with um, cotton and wait a little so that the 
nuggets might suffocate and die. And then um, it is sterile forceps, you can remove the maggots. Again, all this you need to be a little trained in because uh, with the forceps, when you're removing, you shouldn't be, you know, hitting a, uh, you know, blood vessel or something. Um, then again, then once the maggots are out, you can treat it like a normal wound and, um, you know, flush with, um, you know, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this may or may not be used. Um, then, of course, iodine is very important. So, uh, flush it with iodine. You can use acrylin, which is a yellow um, kind of, it's, it's, it's in a tube and that can be used for deep-seated maggot wounds. Again, sprinkle nebesal powder and uh, apply, uh, you know, high max. Um, uh, so, uh, this is a treatment of maggot wounds in general, but uh, remember that you need some kind of experience, you know, to treat these. So, um, what we generally do is that volunteers, you know, who come on our first aid rounds, they go with either the vet or a trained volunteer and observe and learn. And then only after a point of time that they can, you know, do it on their own. They need to also be experienced in holding a dog, um, you know, restraining it, catching it and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, there are some things also that can be treated on the street, but um, uh, if it's not improving, you must go to a veterinarian. Yeah. So your infections, uh, how do you make out um, the symptoms? Uh, generally, you know, the, the, they will keep uh, shaking the ears or repeated scratching. Or, um, you know, if you look into the ear, there's a dark reddish brown waxy deposit. Um, sometimes there's a greenish uh, yellowish discharge or there's a uh, unpleasant smell coming uh, or the dog is always tilting the ear. So you know there's something wrong. And like I said earlier, there's a hematoma, the ear balloons up. Yeah. So the causes could be different. It could be because of ear mites, fungal infections, bacterial infections. These are some of the remedies that are there, uh, you know, calm ear drops or pendistrine or ciplox can be used depending on wow, the reasons uh, behind uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the causes of the uh, infection. But like I said, that if it does not improve, you must uh, take the uh, animal to a veterinarian. Uh, next. Uh, eye infections also, uh, uh, these are some of the symptoms, the swelling, there's a thick discharge, pain, uh, protruding eyeball, redness, uh, many causes are there, conjunctivitis or injury to the eye. Uh, you all know there's a disease called distemper that can cause um, uh, discharge or, the, uh, or there's an infection. Uh, these are some of the remedies that are there, um, uh, like Ciplox, eye drops or Kailash Jeevan, it can go into the eyes uh, or Neomycin, ophthalmic. Uh, but again, you know, um, uh, if uh, a vet sees it, then, you know, he or she can suggest what can be given and maybe you can then continue to uh, treat the animal topically on the street. Uh, next is, um, I think we're almost at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, so skin problems, uh, these are the um, uh, symptoms. Uh, your, your hair loss, redness on skin, constant itching. Um, there are various remedies, like I told you, yellow ointment we make at the uh, center with sulfur, camphor, calendula, and coconut oil. This has worked wonders. Uh, Kailash Jeevan uh, has worked on fungal infections. But you, you might have to contact the veterinarian because it might be maimed, it, you know, uh, scraping might have to be done and so on. Um, next slide, please. This, I think, is, is just like malaria, very difficult to, uh, you know, defeat. Um, so, um, lots of things are always used and uh, physical removal is one thing, but please remember, don't throw it in the, on the ground and crush it. Uh, the tick, I'm saying, uh, you must uh, uh, maybe put it in water or kerosene or something. Um, a no, no ticks powder can be used, but nowadays... Uh, you'll have complaints that it doesn't work. Tick collars can be used. There are various, um, you know, um, uh, treatments like spot on or 
uh, Provecto or, uh, you know, Next Guard, Freedom Spray, uh, and so on, Frontline. Um, but these are all expensive treatments, but uh, uh, they need to be repeated. And um, you know, what we have seen in sleeves is that topic your, you know, the eucalyptus oil spray works on, on sleeves. But again, uh, you must look at uh, uh, if it's severe, a veterinarian needs to be contacted because um, this can go develop into, we see a lot of uh, um, tick fever or leakia which can be quite fatal uh, to the animal. Next, please. So last but not the least, very important to understand uh, approaching a street animal, like I told you earlier, the importance of hygiene for yourself, wearing gloves, again, between two animals. If you have treated an animal or taken an animal with an infectious disease, you shouldn't go and treat another animal. You should go home, have a bath, and then only uh, continue other treatments, um, you must, uh, if you are doing this, um, take um, uh, anti-rabies uh, pre-exposure or prophylactic uh, vaccinations. And please remember that you are not a veterinarian. Yeah, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Next slide. Oof. Thank you both for such an insightful session. It will definitely help everyone to help animals in need. So we have a lot of questions in the chat box. I'll read it for you just, yeah. So the first question we have is, how to make any unknown dog friendly with us at a new place? So I think, I mean, um, more a question to a behaviorist than me, but over, my, over, over time, you know, um, uh, one thing is that uh, food helps, you know, so little treats and so on might help, you know. So once the dog, star dog starts trusting you, naturally, he'll be more approachable. Uh, sometimes some dogs don't like to be, uh, you know, approached. So I, sometimes this whole human, you know, need of wanting this unconditional love. So we want every dog to come and say hello. Um, uh, you know, I, um, in my life, uh, when I go on the streets, either dogs love me or hate me. And many of them hate me also because they, I've treated them. It's like, you know, the young, the child not liking the uh, doctor. So it's like that. So, um, uh, but I think uh, to answer that question, I think food works. Again, food that is, that, um, that should be given to, to an animal. So that, 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 that works over time, you know, to help, uh, you know, that, that's why if you see feeders, a lot of times dogs that don't come to us, actually, we approach the feeders because they are doing amazing service where they're not only uh, treating the dogs, but making them more accessible for healthcare, for vaccination, for sterilization. And that, that food, you know, um, basic need, you know that trust element then is there, and the bond between the feeder and the and the animal. But please do uh, feeding in in whatever the animal uh, welfare board um, you know suggests in terms of the notification and not dirtying the area and so on. Yeah. So nice answer. So we have a second question, which is exactly related to this. Your answer only. So according to you. Uh, which, like, what kind of animal lover and feeders are responsible in terms of their work? I didn't understand. What kind of animal? What, uh, who, the animal lovers and responsible feeders, how do, how can you say that they are responsible in terms of uh -huh, their work? Okay. So I think, uh, I mean, very good question. I think if you, we love animals, okay, and um, there are two, three things that we need to keep in mind. We, of course, are feeding them because that is the basic need. Yeah. The second is that I, I remember seeing Ambuj's um, uh, uh, law presentation among the answers he, he, he gave was that everybody around us may not like animals. Some might be scared and um, uh, it's okay as long as people are not cruel, you know. I mean, we may not like some things. They don't like uh, animals as long as they say live and let live. 
So I think um, responsible feeders should feed in a place where there are less uh, visibility and less people. I always say that you need to make the street animal invisible. What does that mean? Is me? It doesn't mean that they need to disappear. Of course, it means that um, when you are feeding, feed in an area where there is less visibility because uh, human tendency is that they would have seen that animal for years in that area. When they see a person feeding, they have somebody to blame, you know, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, and also I think feeders should also take some responsibility of getting the animal sterilized and vaccinated. You know, uh, organizations like the Welfare of Spray Dogs do it free. You know, so um, and I'm sure there are um, such organizations all over the country. So I think that basic responsibility of ensuring that the a street dog and cat population is controlled in a humane and um, you know scientific manner, so that it's better for all of us. Yeah, uh, should be. So these are some of the points I think are in terms of uh, responsible uh, feeding. And of course, yeah, you see the Animal Welfare Board uh, notification. You know there are a lot of points written there also, so people can have a look at that. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, so um, there is one very tricky question. Can a dog whom we feed certain times and is playful with us can also become aggressive and bite us? Um, you know, uh, it depends no? because um, uh, it could happen if the dog says in pain. So that could be, that could be a cue. Uh, there are a lot of questions that you need to ask. So has the dog been vaccinated? Because if the if there's sudden change in behavior and it starts biting everybody, you know, in the, it could be rabies. Okay, I mean, I don't want to alarm uh, the person, but um, uh, uh, that's why one needs to ask these questions. So, uh, is it just biting everybody that comes in the way, or um, uh, it's just biting certain people? Um, uh, uh, the aggression could be because of uh, say a new dog has entered the, the territory, you know, or it could be also because of, like I said, it's in pain or it's ill, you know. So these are cues that then the feeder should look out for, you know, so that um, uh, then a re a remedial action can be taken. Hmm. Okay. So our next question is, if we get scratches from an unknown dog, we hmm. wash it properly, but uh, it is. Is it important to take rabies shot as well? Yes, because um, uh, see, um, um, uh, if you will look at the whole uh, WHO, you know, grading in terms of bites and so on. You know, I mean, this it's very. There's a difference between theory and practical. Now, um, if it's a known dog and vaccinated and it scratches and there's no blood, then they would say that you do not have to take rabies shots. But if it scratches and there's blood, you know, then um, uh, uh, the WHO recommends that that um, uh, uh, rabies shots need to be taken. Um, again, depending whether the dog isn't vaccinated or non-vaccinated, whether it was a provoked bite or an unprovoked bite, it was playfully playing and, and it scratched you. Yeah. But like I said before, that uh, people who are, say, even feeding animals or... Um, of course, doing administering first aid, yeah, they should uh, take uh, preventive uh, prophylactic shots. Uh, in fact, WHO has now even changed in places like in Bombay and some of the government hospitals. The um, uh, uh, the the, uh, the protocol has changed now that they are from uh, intramuscular. They are now giving intradermal shots, and the duration has decreased, and also the uh, quantity or the amount of um, you know the vaccine has gone down and uh, the idea was because earlier it used to be day zero day three day seven day um, 14 and day 21 or 28 and a lot of times people used to not go for all the shots you know so now they have uh, you know made it into four and and so on but uh, but intradermal you know so but not everybody can give that but it's very important to to um, to take shots because uh, rabies is, uh, you know, um, like I keep repeating, uh, 
uh, is uh, not curable but highly preventable. Yeah, absolutely right. So here comes our next question. So, who accord? Uh, how can community engagement can be helpful for welfare of street dogs? Yeah, I think um, the first thing for community engagement. See, I mean, you will see every city. You read, the, open the newspaper, and you will see that uh, there are. Uh, two kinds of or three kinds of people, one people like you and me, and I'm sure a lot of us who are attending um, IFA, are, they just love, 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 love animals and, and street uh, animals. Uh, the second are a small, um, uh, and we are again a small uh, percentage. A small percentage is, is uh, a people who, who hate them and who don't want them around, I mean, and so on. But a majority is neutral. They really don't, they don't look at it this way or that way. And I think we need to engage with them because um, we need to uh, ensure that we live and let live. So we also need to um, change if we have any aggressive stand that we need to dilute that because we might, whatever we might say that I love animals and I don't love human beings. Um, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, um, uh, animals or street animals have to live around human beings and not only human beings like you and me who, who love them, but also human beings who might be neutral or hate them. So I think, you know, we need to adhere to some kind of, you know, guidelines in terms of, again, going back to responsible feeding or getting the dogs uh, vaccinated and sterilized um, and vaccinated every year and sterilized or uh, you know um, uh, I mean I remember you know years back uh, there was this person I always give this example how egos human egos actually um, you know are detrimental to to street animals is that there used to be this person who used to walk on marine drive if you come to Bombay marine drive is is a beautiful place to walk and he used to feed uh, uh, he used to feed animals on street dogs on on marine drive and there's to be an old gentleman who used to walk and he said you know will you feed them on the other side of the road and um, for the dogs it wouldn't have been made a, it wouldn't have made a difference they were not territorial i can understand you know sometimes territories are a problem but uh, this gentleman said you know he said tumhara baap ka rasta hai kya main idhar hi you know and um, uh, and that see such incidents then put people off and it's a human, and, and it's the ego thing where the animal then then gets you know in the middle. Of course, cruelty cannot be tolerated. But this was just that the guy could have crossed the road and walked because you also know a lot of times when we are feeding animals, they are possessive of you, and sometimes they run behind people at that point of time. You know, otherwise they will be sitting quietly. You know, um, but just at that point of time, they might be um, a little. Uh, you know, aggressive in terms of what people might think aggression, they might be playful also. So, so I think it's very important for us to engage with the community. You know, sometimes there are a lot of myths. We, we need to educate children on how to be around uh, animals. You know, um, we did a study many years back and um, uh, a, a huge percentage of bites are because of ch children. And when we went to schools, children never lie, parents will and all of them, it were all provoked bites. I mean, 99% were provoked bites that, you know, I pulled a tail, I touched it when the dog was eating and so on. But we need to spread this awareness. Or the, or the example of the slum I gave you, where we started treating animals there. And the cruelty was because they didn't know how to handle a maggot wound. They thought, kutta pagal ho gaya. And the dog is running helter-skelter with a maggot wound on the head and going to people's houses. And remember, there's a, you know, eight by eight coli that they live in. So, and it's stinking. I mean, I don't know if you know, many of you would have smelt a maggot wound. It's really, I mean, for you and me also it is. So imagine for a person who's not really um, loves animals or is neutral, you know. So I think once people understood that it's not harmful, they, they change the way they look at street animals. So I think, you know, if we do these things, of course, again, I repeat that, Cruelty can't be tolerated, but if we have to bend a little in terms of, uh, I mean, dogs don't, animals don't have egos, 
dogs are okay changing the timing of feed changing where they eat as long as it's in their territory and so on but we have a problem with that so a lot of time that is what happens yeah i agree so what do you think like what can be the role of youth or we can say that college going student uh, for the welfare of street animals oh, i think i mean the youth have a big uh, role to play here because uh, you know um, people like me and you are young but people like me you know we do we are so uh, we don't change you know so whatever we do uh, i mean we there's something that notion that we carry and we don't change but but the young children the youth they change i mean there have been incidences when uh, kids have come to our center and are scared petrified of dogs or uh, uh, and uh, um, they say i don't want to do anything as i don't do just sit and watch and after a point of time they themselves say can i touch can i do this and then they don't want to go away but my wife was petrified of animals i have not been able to to change so so the, i think the youth um, one is that um, spread the word uh, volunteer with uh, you know um, the local uh, shelter ngo you know i mean uh, parallelly i think there is a volunteer uh, management session going on and i think um, you know we need all the the we in the sense the animals really need all the help that we can get because um, we've come a long way remember that uh, 25 30 years ago street dogs used to be killed okay and um, thankfully that is history and um, i think the uh, if you want to take it forward i think it's just the the youth that will that will uh, you know take this forward so so they have a huge huge role to play in in um, spreading the the values of compassion kindness um, live and let live like i said you don't have to convert everybody to an to an animal lover but at least you know that you need to see that uh, we can coexist peacefully yeah well said very well said so one question um it is difficult to administrate medicine to stray dogs physical application is not possible because they get suspicious oral 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 medication is uh, possible for the first two to three times hidden in a paneer ball but after that they get suspicious of that too. what can be done in this situation so then like i said that not all animals can be treated on the street okay so uh, many years back when we did a uh, uh, we used to get you know x amount of calls on a helpline and maybe 60% of the animals or 70% could be treated on the street and uh, if you go back to that slide you know um, uh, what are the different animals that can be uh, treated so if they can't be treated then you'll have to um, uh, take the animal into a facility and then then treat it because it's no point in uh, trying to treat an animal if the medicine is not going in if it's not going to get better on the street you know and again the medicine that you are giving please 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 um consult a vet or ensure that a vet is seeing the animal before administrate uh, administering the medicine you and i are not vets you may might think we are vets but and you might be called on the road when i walk people call doctor i am not a doctor but uh, um uh, but you must uh, you know then take this uh, animal because uh, remember that if uh, Uh, if you're giving an antibiotic, which is prescribed by a vet, and I'm, I'm saying that in inverted commas because unfortunately we have a lot of people quacking antibiotics, and that's not good. The same thing um, wo- happens in in animals also, um, um, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. And uh, uh, so you you must uh, so one day you'll give a, the because remember there's a dose. and uh, it needs to be uh, uh, completed and you one day you can give it second day you can't so it's better to take that to a facility and then treat uh, you know the animal yeah which is the best uh, like most safest antibiotic you can say for no, street yeah. dogs i don't think uh, uh, i'm in a position to uh, recommend i'm not a veterinarian and i do not uh, uh, there's none there's no mantra here is a mm-hmm. basic first aid and i don't think anybody should should say which mm-hmm. is the safest or not safest yes, yes. Um, say not safest of course but safest antibiotic because uh, you need to 
um, consult a vet. Consult a vet. Yeah. Okay. So one question is there. My dog has been affected with a maggoted wound in his scrotum. It looks like a hole from outside. We can inject Dmax spray into the scrotum wound hole, or uh, should I spray it around the wound only? So yeah, I mean, you can um, uh, spray. Uh, like I said, you know, um, uh, that's not the best place to have a maggot wound. And um, uh, you can spray it uh, on the uh, inside the, this also, you know. Um, uh, and uh, But you need to ensure that uh, you uh, then dress the wound with uh, iodine and then, uh, you know, um, uh, sulfide powder if possible and high max because remember that if the dog has got a maggot wound there uh, the recurrence of it getting uh, you know flies laying eggs is very very high which means that uh, high max really and I'm telling you I'm I'm a great believer of high max and um, it will keep away the flies so every day if you keep putting high max once the maggots are out you know and of course uh, the um, uh, dressing the wound, uh, the wound will heal as long as the everything else with the dog is fine because it, it shouldn't be that the dog is dehydrated or you know anemic and so on. So then you it will require fluid therapy or injections in terms of iron and so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Abhut. It was amazing he hearing from you today. And uh, we uh, we can end this session right here. And uh, also there is uh, award ceremony going in the auditorium section. So you all can head back to the auditorium. One. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Thank you.